Hi, we're going to be talking about corporate governance and issues involving the responsibility of businesses and of leading businesses. What should a board of directors do? What's the right set of responsibilities for a board of directors? Who should be on the board? How do we think about how to manage a company? I'm here at a corporate center, which is fairly empty today because of the coronavirus, to talk about those kinds of issues. And today I want to focus in particular on Stout's compromise. We've talked so far about Milton Friedman's managerial theory. We've talked about Edward Freeman's stakeholder theory. And they're going to have different implications for what a board of directors ought to do, to whom it should be accountable, what its goals ought to be, and in general, what a corporate manager's goals ought to be. Well, there are actually a number of different issues we can think about in connection with this. After all, there are many different kinds of norms that govern corporate behavior and that govern the behavior of corporate leaders and corporate managers. There are some legal norms, for example. There are laws that govern what people's responsibilities are and also that assign them certain rights. There are moral constraints that go beyond the law, but what virtuous, or vicious behavior would be, even if it's within the bounds of the law. And then there are all sorts of informal societal norms, things that affect how business is conducted, how businesses are led, what businesses do and how they think of themselves in society that go far beyond strictly ethical norms that are more cultural and broad based. In any case, some of these norms are formally written out, as laws are. Others are informal. In fact, most of us couldn't really articulate the kinds of norms that govern behavior of corporations or within corporations in the United States. They're things that people familiar with corporations know, more or less intuitively, they've picked them up, they know what appropriate and inappropriate behavior are, but they don't really have an articulated framework, a formal set of rules um, by which they operate. In general, the larger an organization is, the more formal rules there are, and you might say smaller organizations, especially startups, entrepreneurial organizations, tend to have more informal norms, relatively fewer formal ones. Well, I want to talk about a possible compromise between the managerial theory and the stakeholder theory. This compromise technically is a form of stakeholder theory because it's going to assume in the end that all stakeholders are relevant to, to decisions. But it's not strictly the same as Freeman's theory. In fact, it is modified. And then I will modify that modification further into a different kind of compromise. But let's start by thinking about a principle of director primacy. This is what Stout proposes, namely that there is a kind of argument for the managerial theory, and it's one that needs to be taken seriously. It's going to lead us to modify our conception of stakeholders, their proper role. In a sense, it will be true that they all have to be taken into consideration, but take it into consideration to different degrees and in different ways. So let's start with what Stout considers the best argument for the managerial theory. It's called the agency cost argument. And it starts with the concept of what an agent is. After all, Milton Friedman's argument in favor of the managerial theory is primarily that managers are agents of the owners of the corporation. So a manager is an agent of a shareholder. And what in general is the obligation of an agent? Agents are supposed to represent the interests of the principal. So if I hire a real estate agent, they're supposed to represent my interests. If I hire a lawyer, same thing in a court of law. Well, that's what a manager is supposed to do, represent the interests of the owners, according to Friedman. And there is something powerful about that. But there's also a problem. And to understand the agency cost argument, we need to think about that problem. It's called the principal agent problem. And in a sense, the problem is obvious from the very structure of the agent principal relationship. What do I mean? Well, agents are supposed to represent the interests of the principal. But of course, agents naturally tend, as human beings, to represent their own interests. And they ideally find some kind of balance of these. In fact, you might say, ideally, they are in business as agents. And so they do a good job of serving their interests to the extent that they successfully represent the principal's interest. A good real estate agent, for example, does well by representing the client's interests very well. And the same thing is true with a lawyer and a variety of other people who are hired as agents negotiating on someone else's behalf. They're successful as agents because they do such a good job of representing their client's interests. 
And so it's not as if this is something that is necessarily a problem. In fact, you might think the structure of agency ideally should be to promote a convergence of the principal's interests and the agent's interests. But there can be situations where those interests diverge. Now, sometimes it's a direct conflict of interest, but sometimes it's really part of, you might say, the structure of that kind of agency. Um, and those become, in any case, subtle problems. A good example of this, actually, might be a politician. A politician is, in a sense, elected as a representative of the people, and so is to be an agent of that politician's constituents. However, once in office, the politician finds there are all sorts of incentives to behave in ways that promote the interests of the representative, of the agent, as opposed to the constituents. And so it's difficult in politics to get your representative to continue representing you as opposed to representing their own interests. It's a commonplace that congressmen, for example, vote themselves raises over voting benefits to their own constituents, or at the very least, benefit themselves as part of the cost of doing business, part of the cost of representing their constituents. And sometimes they act in ways that benefit themselves without any reference to this. In fact, there's an entire school of economics called public choice theory devoted to the study of people who work for government and other agencies that supposedly serve the public interest. The best predictor of what they will do is that they will act on the basis of their own self-interest and not on the public interest at all. But let's put that special case aside. The general problem, the principal agent problem, is that it's going to be tempting for agents to act in their own interests instead of representing the interests of the principal. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we try to find ways of, first of all, measuring the performance of the agent. We want some measure to find out, are they doing a good job or not? Or not. Now, sometimes that's pretty easy. Let's say I'm a sports star, I'm a baseball pitcher, let's say, and I'm hiring an agent to represent me in salary negotiations and contract negotiations with my team. I look at the terms of the contract and say, are they beneficial to me? Or maybe I've hired a real estate agent. I say, how well did that person do at showing me houses that I like, at negotiating a good price for the house, and so on. And so I find ways of constructing a measure. In addition to that, there should be incentives so that the agent has an incentive to represent the interests of the principal. After all, they're going to have a certain set of incentives to benefit themselves, namely that very benefit. So we need to build into the structure in some way, incentives that push in the other direction, that push the agent in the direction of representing the interests of the principal. Sometimes, as I say, that's really part and parcel of the agent-principal relationship. There is an incentive built into the very structure of the relationship, but not always. And so ideally, we want to build that in. We want to make sure that the agent has incentives to represent the principal. Well, there's a cost to hiring an agent, not only the direct cost of paying the real estate agent the fee, paying the attorney, and so forth, but also the cost of taking the risk that they will not represent your interests, but represent their own interests, or maybe the interests of someone else whose interests they place above yours. And so it can be tricky. You want to make sure that you have that measure, you have incentives in place, and you are taking a risk. And so there's a cost to agency, a cost to the principal, that is to say, in hiring an agent, both the direct cost and also the cost involved in taking that risk. Here's the relevance of that to the general issue of the managerial theory versus the stakeholder theory. The managerial theory says that managers are agents of the owners. The owners are taking a risk in hiring managers to represent their interests. They want to set up incentives so that those managers will serve their interests rather than their own particular interests. Moreover, they want a measure of how successful that manager is at representing the interests of the owner. Well, the managerial theory offers such incentives, but it also offers the measure more fundamentally. The measure is simply profits, the stock price, things that are directly perceivable, directly measurable. So we can look at the stock price, see how it's doing, seeing if the managers are doing a good job of representing the interests of the owners. But suppose instead we're adherents of stakeholder theory. Then we think it's a question of benefits to the community. Well, the utilitarian thinks those can be quantified, but how exactly do we do that? It's an immensely complicated problem, and it's not an easy thing to look at. So if as a corporate shareholder, for example, or owner or director, 
I look at performance of the managers and I say, well, stock price has risen nicely, we've beaten the market here and we've done well, then I've got measures. I can measure performance and I can reward people appropriately to give them incentives to continue that good performance. But suppose I'm looking, well, how did we do in benefiting the community at large? I have no idea how to measure that. And so I don't know how to set up incentives to structure things, in other words, in such a way as to overcome the principal agent problem. It looks like I'm taking a much greater risk. So to the extent that we think of managers as agents of the shareholders or owners, we are going to want a clear measure of performance, and we're going to want to be able to structure incentives to promote good performance. The managerial theory gives us a way of doing that. The stakeholder theory doesn't.